Hi everyone, I'm here today to talk to you about all of the books that I read last month in May. This video is very kindly sponsored by Skillshare, which I will talk about later on in the video. Now, I am surrounded by piles of books, and I think a very good indicator for how good my mental health is at any given point is to count how many books are sitting partially read on my bedside table. Obviously reading lots of books can be an escape, but if I'm feeling very overwhelmed with things, I'll often dip between lots of lots of different books and uh, my reading can get a little bit erratic. And I feel like that was what it was like last month. Last month was not so great for me, but touch wood, feeling a little bit better. So there are some books in this pile that I really loved and I wanna to talk to you about. There are some books that I haven't finished and would like to show you very briefly and there are some books in this pile that I actually ended up DNFing. One of those because last month I just don't think was a good month for me to be reading it and I would like to go back to that book at some point and two because I just don't think that they're a great fit for me at, at any point. We have um, different things that we look for in a book and that's absolutely fine. So let me begin with the two books that I DNF'd. The first one I don't have to hand and that is Ready Player Two, which is the sequel to Ready Player One. It was a bit of a leap of faith with this one anyway because I had seen a lot of negative reviews of this book. I just found it to be quite hyperbolic as though it was a caricature of itself and yeah, just didn't enjoy it. And the other one that I ended up DNFing, which was a shame is the Southern Book Club's Guide to Slaying Vampires, which is a very long title, which I love. Um, this is, again, I think just a case of tone. And what I would really love actually is to see a film version of this. And I'm sure that it will be made into either a film or TV show at some point. It really reads like a film. It's very fast paced. The premise is really intriguing and exciting. And that's why I picked it up in the first place. Also because April said it's her new favourite horror book and before that I think her favourite horror book was Bird Box which is my favourite horror book so I thought well okay well maybe I will love this book too. This book I had expected I think to be more serious than it actually is. It is quite tongue in cheek in places. It is about a woman called Patricia Campbell which is the name of my grandmother and she is part of a book club and there are elements in this that reminded me of Motherland, a TV show that I love. She's trying to organise her family, she has um, a relative, a sick relative who's moved in with them and she's trying to deal with that. She's feeling very flustered and she finds that her local book club grounds her. It's something that they've set up where they meet up and discuss true crime books and they're really really obsessed with these true crime books and then vampires arrive, vampiric things start happening, and that's when the book kind of lost me. I was hanging on a little bit by a thread before that just because of how fast paced it was. I really wished it would slow down and that I could get to the, the meat of the book, but I know so many people love it, and I'm thrilled that other people absolutely love it. I wanted to love it too, but I didn't. The third book that I DNF'd, which is the one that I'll probably go back to at some point, is Someone Else's Skin by Sarah Hillary. This one is one that I was listening to on audiobook. And it has two mysteries in it, mainly because it is the first in a series. So I think it's, it's setting up a long narrative that will go across several books. And then you have the individual mystery that's going on in one book. And I was intrigued by that because, you know, broken record again, trying to find a new series of books that can rival the Frida Klein series by Nikki French. This is a detective called Marnie Rome and the mystery that's going on in her life is that her parents were killed and at first the setup is quite clever. The initial chapter makes it seem like something specific has happened and then you learn later that that isn't actually true and I was so invested in her personal circumstances and in what had happened in her past that I thought was really fascinating. I was less interested in the mystery that she was trying to solve and I think that that was partly due to the fact that it was a lot to do with male violence against women and I just wasn't really in a place for reading that last month so I definitely want to go back to it at some point because I was hooked on the character and the main storyline that I'm sure will extend across the series so I would like to give that another chance but I've put it down for now. A book that I read last month and really loved is this tiny little volume here which is called The Last Resort by Jan Carson. I read her short story, oh my gosh I can't remember the title of it but I will link it in the description box down below. 
it was shortlisted for last year's BBC National Short Story Award. Sarah Hall ended up winning in the end. Her story, which I think was called The Grotesques, was also really great. But Jan's was definitely my favourite and I hadn't read her work before and I just thought I need to read a book by her. The short story that had been shortlisted was about a big family gathering and she just so expertly managed to convey the personalities of lots of different people in a really short amount of time and I bawled my eyes out at that story. I just thought it was phenomenal. So I really trusted her and I really wanted to read more of her short stories. So this is her latest book, which has just come out. And if you have read Summer Water by Sarah Moss, I think you would really love this. They're actually doing a, a literary event together this summer because their books thematically are very similar. Both of them are set on a trailer park and both of them focus on one character or one family in each chapter. And all of their narratives come together to give a big picture about life on this particular trailer park. Loved both of them. I thought that this was the perfect balance of tension and intrigue and a tiny smidgen of magical realism in there as well which didn't feel surprising when it came about and I think some of the instances of that in here could be explained away by someone being drunk and perhaps seeing things or thinking things that aren't true but either way I think that this book works whether or not you read that as actual things that are happening or just things people would like to happen I loved it and it's only I think exactly a hundred pages I sat down and read this is it exactly a hundred no it's not it's 97 97 pages I sat down one morning and read this before Mr M was up and it was just a lovely reading experience it took me about an hour and a half I had a cup of tea I just felt really invested in all these people's lives and I thought that it was a delight Another book that was an absolute delight was The House Opposite by Barbara Noble. Now, I have mentioned this in a video probably a couple of months ago because that's when I started reading it and I ended up putting it down and I was really worried about picking it up again simply because I had been loving it and I was worried I'd done this book a disservice by putting it down again. You know when you lose momentum with a book and you go back to it and it's just... I know you can't get back into your stride. I did not have that problem with this book when I picked it up again. And I think that's testament to how brilliant it is and how strong the narrative voice in here is, how great the characters are and how safe I felt in Barbara Noble's storytelling technique. I have looked up her other books. She has one book called Doreen, which I have read and loved and it's published by Persephone. Everything else of hers is out of print and I'm really sad about that. And I'm hoping maybe Persephone will reprint something of hers in the future. I just think she's such a delight. So this was published in 1943. So she was writing it during the Blitz and it's about the Blitz. It's about a woman called Elizabeth Simpson who is having an affair with her boss. She's his secretary, cliche probably. And um, it's also about Owen Cathcart, who's a boy who lives opposite her. And both of them are on fire guard duty during the Blitz. And that's how they come to talk to each other. They don't have loads of interactions, but they just gradually get to exist in each other's spaces. And, and I really like the way their opinions of each other changed as they came together. This is something that reminds me of Pursuit of Love, which I haven't read by Nancy Mitford, but it reminds me of the recent TV adaptation with Lily James. It has that element of romance in it and being swept up in stuff. Also that is set during the Blitz and not really knowing who people are and, and just hoping for the best. Elizabeth definitely feels like that with her boss, Alex. She's hoping that everything's going to be perfect, even though she knows it's not going to be because he's married and it's kind of all falling apart, but she's just keeping her fingers crossed and focusing on doing nice things like going out to dinner and ignoring really the bombs falling on their relationship in the same way she's trying to ignore the bombs falling on the city. This book also in some ways reminded me of Virginia Woolf's Mrs. Dalloway in the sense that Elizabeth could be a little bit of a Mrs. Dalloway character and Owen could definitely be like the soldier character in Mrs. Dalloway who's come back from war and is really traumatized. He is getting ready to be called up himself and he's grappling with the feelings that he has for a man in his life called Derek who doesn't seem to love him back or at least he's never voiced his feelings so he's not sure but he knows that he has really strong feelings for Derek. There are probably 
clumsy subtext comparisons going on saying that Elizabeth's relationship with her boss would be frowned upon in the same way that Owen's relationship with Derek or another man would be frowned upon but obviously those situations are very very different Owen would be being punished for simply being who he is whereas Elizabeth would be you know be frowned upon because she was going after a married man or, or whatever the circumstances are very different but i appreciate that in 1943 both of those relationships would be somewhat looked down upon by a lot of society there is a beautiful scene in here where owen ends up talking to elizabeth's dad at one point and elizabeth's dad is talking about how he had a friend when he was younger which was very much like the relationship that owen has with derek and I thought that that was a lovely, subtle exploration of sexuality. And it was painful to read, actually, because the way that Elizabeth's father was talking about it was in this very wistful way. And then later he's asked if he was ever in love before he married Elizabeth's mother. And he says, once, only once that counted. And you could tell he's thinking about that other relationship that he had with the man beforehand. And yeah, just so sad that all of these possibilities were shut down for so many people. I would have preferred more overt discussion of queerness and sexuality, but that's just not what these characters felt comfortable doing. So we were just allowed to exist in this in-between space that they were existing in and be there with them through the things that they were going through. I thought it covered so much in, in about 200 pages and I definitely think it's one of my favourite books of the year so far. A book that I read and enjoyed but it hasn't had a lasting impression on me is A Room Called Earth by Madeleine Ryan. It really sweeps you up. It's told in a very colloquial way as though someone is just speaking to you. This is an own voices neurodivergent book about a woman who's getting ready to go to a party. She talks about all the things she's thinking about. She's getting ready to go to this party and then all the encounters that she has with people once she gets there. It is endlessly readable. But I, I think I said in a reading vlog when I was reading this that there were just elements to this that reminded me of Normal People by Sally Rooney, which is a book that so many people love. And I'm trying to work out what it is about both of those titles that makes me shrink back a little bit. I'm not sure if it is the romanticization of romance, which I feel happens a little bit in those books, even though they're being very honest about romance, it almost glorifies the misunderstandings that people have and the tragedies of love. And as a reader, I just find that really, really frustrating when I feel as though situations are being manipulated or orchestrated in order to cause those misunderstandings, which could be very easily solved. I just don't believe that people actually act like that on the whole. Yes, misunderstandings happen, but not to the extent that I think happens, especially in normal people. So I had similar feelings with some elements of this book. I spoke about this a little bit in more detail in the reading vlog where I was reading it. I would recommend it. It's just if I had to sit down and write an essay about it now, and it's only a week after I finished reading it, I don't think that I would have loads to say. I feel like it kept me company and I appreciate it for that but it's just not a favourite. Two books that I am part of the way through, which I hope to finish in June. This is Growing Up Disabled in Australia. I know I didn't finish reading this the month before either. This is now being split over three months of reading and I'm completely okay with that. It's meaning that I can digest this properly. I'm really enjoying it every time I pick it up. It is a heavy read in the sense that I just feel like, obviously I read a lot of work to do with disability and as a disabled person that that just becomes a lot, especially someone who advocates too. It's it's something that I'm living in my everyday life, then something that I'm reading about, and is also something that I do as part of my work. So I feel like I have to ration myself slightly. But again, all the stuff in here that I've been reading so far, I have loved, and I'm sure it's gonna be one of my favorite books of the year. And the novel that I have started reading is this one, which is so intriguing. It's called Composite Creatures by Caroline Hardacre. Now, transparency, I was sent this and I posted about this on Instagram, which was a, um, a partnership with Angry Robot, the publisher. And this is not part of the promotion at all. They haven't asked me to speak about it, but I just wanted to mention that I did do an Instagram post about it. And this is a book that I'm really enjoying. I always actually find it really frustrating when people equate novels to 
other famous books. So for instance, it, in the world of publishing at one point, obviously every middle grade book that was sent my way in an email with an AI sheet said the next Harry Potter. And after a while that starts to become meaningless, right? But I do like to do a little bit of book maths, which I've spoken about on this channel before, which is where you say, if you take an element of this and an element of that and smush it together, then you'll get this book over here. And I do feel as though this has elements of Ishiguro's Never Let Me Go, it has elements of Karen Thompson Walker's The Age of Miracles, but it also really reminded me of The Memory Police by Yoko Ogawa, which is about a world where things are disappearing, so roses will disappear, but not only in physical form, people will forget the names for those things. So in this book, the stars have disappeared and the birds have disappeared. Our main character is remembering her mother telling her, you know, about the stars and the birds and she's rolling her eyes a little bit in the way that younger people often roll their eyes at stories from older people that don't seem particularly relevant to themselves. We then jump forward to her being older and going on a date with a man and on the date they share portfolios and that really reminded me of not only Kazu Ishiguro but also TV shows like Soulmates. It has this dystopian black mirror feeling to it. It's all very friendly at the moment but I have a feeling it's going to descend into something that is not friendly at all. It's a setup that feels very familiar whilst also being otherworldly. It feels realistic and there are so many different directions that it could go in and I'm just not sure which one of those paths it's going to take and I am intrigued by it. So this is one that I need to finish in June so that I can tell you if the reveals are satisfactory. I really hope so. Before I get on to the rest of these books, as I mentioned at the beginning, this video is very kindly sponsored by Skillshare. So let me chat to you about that for a second. Oh look, we have teleported across the room. Teleporting is not something that Skillshare can teach you how to do, but they can help you learn lots of other really cool things. Skillshare is an online learning community and I have been working with them for years. I think that what they do is great. They have given me a link, which I'm gonna put at the top of the description box down below. And the first 1000 people to click on that link will get a free trial of Skillshare Premium. If you would like to learn how to look after your houseplants, if you would like to learn how to be more organized, if you would like to learn how to set up a writing habit or a different kind of routine, they have videos on those subjects. Everything apart from teleportation, but you know, never say never. Three classes that I particularly wanted to highlight. First one is one that I hope to learn so many invaluable things from, and this is gluten-free baking, mastering a versatile, delicious cake for all diets. So my mum-in-law, Mr. M's mum, has celiac, so she can't have the delicious baking that I make. And I can do some gluten-free baking, but my goodness, I tried to make gluten-free bread the other day and it was not, it was not something that I really wanted to share with her. So I'm really hoping that I can find more delicious things to cook that suit that gluten-free flour, which can be quite tricky to work with. And therefore I can give her lots of delicious things to eat. And you know, I look forward to that. I also wanted to mention some book related things. As I mentioned in previous videos, Roxanne Gay has a writing class on Skillshare. Roxanne Gay, yes, I've mentioned that before, but yes, I will mention it again because it is Roxanne Gay teaching you about writing. Why wouldn't you want to watch that video? If you are into books, but perhaps writing is not your thing, maybe you're more into art and you wanna learn about book cover design, Jessica Hirsch has a class on Skillshare called Illustrated Lettering, designing a book cover, which looks really fascinating. As I said, they have thousands and thousands of videos on their platform. Go and check out the link at the top of the description box down below. If you do wanna continue after your free trial, it's a really affordable platform and premium membership works out at about $10 a month which is pretty damn good for all of the things that you can access. Thanks so much to Skillshare for sponsoring this video. Back to the books. Welcome back. As you know, I do freelance writing and I review books in various different places. And one of those places is Toast, which is a clothing company, but they also have an online magazine. Um, and so for next month, I will be reviewing these four pamphlets. So I'm not gonna talk about them here because I need to write the review for them first. So I will mention that again in June, but I read these in May. These are published by Rough Trade Books and I think that they're really fascinating. This first one here has got a brilliant name. It's called Hall to Cultural Appropriation. And that sums up what all of these pamphlets are about because they are a series about gardening, both personal, but also 
social gardening and open spaces as well as private large gardens such as Kew Gardens but also encompassing parks in general. Looking at gardening through a critical perspective, how much we love them but also access to green spaces, also why and how plants have travelled around the world and links to colonialism and, and stuff like that and I have found them really really wonderful. I will link them in the description box down below if you would like to go and check them out. Each one comes with um, a little, I was going to call it a patch, a seedling strip. So this one has herb seeds in it, some of the others have wildflower seeds in and you can plant them in your garden or in any green space and I think that that is really lovely. So that's something that I read in May but for the article that went up recently for Toast, it was an interview that I did with Polly Barton who is the author of 50 Sounds. This is one of my favourite books of the year, I really really love it and earlier this year I sat down virtually and spoke with Polly about it. So this is a book, I've reviewed it before on here so I'll just mention it briefly. It is a book where she's talking about the translation process, what it is like to translate texts, in this case from Japanese into English, and she's interspersing those thoughts between parts of memoir discussing moving from the UK to Japan, what that was like, what she has learned, how she thinks about language and how she thought about language before she moved to Japan as well. So the article that I posted on Toast this month was the interview with her and I mention that because the book is brilliant but also because I would love you to go and read the interview because I thought the answers that she gave were just really really fascinating. I'll read one to you now and I'll link it in the description box down below so that you can go and find out more. One of the questions that I posed to Polly was you say there are often clouds inside me and I am vaguely peripherally aware that they are made up of some kind of vaporized emotion, end quote. Without meaning to sound reductive, do you find that it is easier slash more satisfying to express certain types of emotion in either Japanese or English? Which would you feel yourself gravitating towards in a given example and why? And Polly said, for sure, yes. I feel that there are certain emotions which just aren't routinely expressed in Japanese or in English or just have a different set of cultural associations and baggage attached. A very common emotional reaction in Japanese is kuyashi, which is something like the bitterness of losing out on something. The kind of feeling where you want to say, it's so unfair, even though you know objectively that it's perfectly fair. Also, the sensation of something being nostalgic, natsuakshi, is expressed very often with no particular constraints on time frame. Something from two weeks previously can still be natsuakshi in extreme cases. I often find myself wanting to express those feelings in English and struggling to do so, but of course, until learning Japanese and being in that context, I never felt them to be lacking. I was listening to a podcast about this the other day, about how we learn emotions within a specific environment, a familial one firstly, but then more widely a particular socio-cultural context whose specificity we might not realise. So although we might translate words like sadness or anxiety unproblematically across different languages, it's still the case that what constitutes being sad, what sad behaviour is, might be very different from one country to the next. I will link that interview in the description box down below. 50 Sounds is published by Fitzcarraldo Editions and another one of the Fitzcarraldo Editions books that I read last month was Ill Feelings by Alice Hattrick. This is coming out in August so I read an advanced proof copy of this and I spoke about it in a reading vlog that I uploaded the other week so I will just mention very briefly here that this is Alice writing a memoir of herself and her mother having ME CFS and all of the medical complications of that but also the history of ME and how it may have materialised at different points in historic times with different names and I found that so very very interesting. I think she navigates narratives surrounding pain and crip time as we call it so time spent looking after yourself or chasing referrals or whatever so brilliantly. She has a section at the end where she's talking about investigative stuff into long COVID and how that's brilliant but also frustrating because the similarities between long COVID and ME and CFS are vast but obviously long COVID is now being taken much more seriously by medical professionals than ME ever has been in the past by the majority of doctors. It was really really good. A book that I didn't love as much, sadly, was The Safe House by Nikki French. I have read so many of their books now. You know that I have. And this 
probably along with Secret Smile, is my least favourite of, out of the books that they have written. This is a book about a woman called Sam who specialises in PTSD and she's left London though not gone very far. She's moved to Stanmore I think which is very close to London and she set up a new clinic there where she's about to start work. She's taken a couple of months off to write a book and as she's writing this book there is a crime that happens near her local area where a family home is broken into, the parents who live there are killed, the girl who lives there is absolutely traumatised and the girl ends up coming to live with Sam, which seemed a bit ridiculous and elaborate but there is actually a reason for that later. I liked that up until about halfway through when the whole thing started to feel a little bit ridiculous and the resolution I didn't find particularly satisfying. I didn't think that there were enough twists. I felt as though it was solved quite early on but then kept on going and I found that a little bit of a letdown. I would say if you were looking for a place to start with Nikki French, because on the whole I absolutely adore the books that they write, I would of course recommend reading the Frida Klein series. The first one is Blue Monday. There are eight in that series and they're incredible, especially the audiobooks narrated by Beth Chalmers. But if you're looking for a standalone, I think I would recommend House of Correction first, which is actually their most recent release. I have reviewed that before. I'll link my review in the description box down below. I also really loved Memory Game and a book of theirs that I read last month, which is called Beneath the Skin. So on the whole, I think that they're amazing. So obviously there are going to be some books of theirs that I love more than others and this one was really not a favourite of mine. Finally, I read these five, um, I was going to say literary journals. Three of them are literary journals and two of them are lifestyle journals. And I talked about four of these in a video specifically dedicated to trying to find new favourite journals. And I'll link that up here and in the description box down below. And the fifth one is one that will be talked about in the second half of that video where I read five more literary journals and that is Sick, which I really, really love. This is issue two. Um, so if you wanna hear my thoughts on these journals, I will link that video in the description box down below. And as I said, I will speak about Sick in the second part of that video, which I'm hoping to have up in the next month. I will talk about Sick and Lighthouse the Rialto and a couple of other journals which I have just sitting over there on my book trolley. So those are all of the books that I read in May or am part of the way through. I would love to know if you have read any of these or if they are on your shelf, on your TBR. Let me know in a comment down below. Thanks again to Skillshare for sponsoring this video. Make sure you check out the link which is at the top of the description box down below. I will speak to you all very soon and sending lots of love. Bye!